Hello and welcome everyone to the first Kalman Syndrome Community Webinar. My name is Rob Platika and I'm the Online Community Manager at the European Organization for Rare Diseases, EuroDes. Uh, we've just created a new community on rareconnect.org uh, for Kalman Syndrome and this webinar is an introduction to that community and to the webinar series uh, that we would like to do. It's also a chance to ask some questions uh, about Kalman syndrome to our specialist, uh, Andrew, Dry, uh, Andrew Dwyer, who's here with us today. We also have uh, Neil Smith, a uh, patient advocate, who will be um, helping us to uh, uh, understand the Kalman syndrome community and the webinar uh, series. Uh, so first of all, Rare Connect is a project of uh, Eurydice. We have 60 uh, different online communities. This is the portal homepage that you're seeing now. Uh, each community is in five languages, English, French, German, Italian, and Spanish, with human translation of all stories and on-demand human translation of forum posts. In this way, uh, we want to connect both patient groups and patients and families affected by rare diseases across the language barrier and uh, across the globe. Uh, overall, the platform gets 70,000 uh, monthly unique visits from over 170 countries. Uh, 2,500 members visit each month out of a total of 10,000 registered members. And remarkably, each member spends about 12 minutes uh, when they're on the community which means they're responding to forum posts, answering questions, and sharing valuable experiences. Last year, uh, the platform and the community had over 6,000 uh, member-generated content items, like stories, forum posts, webinar videos like this. Uh, here is just uh, a list of a few of the other rare diseases that are on Rare Connect. But we're very happy and pleased to have just launched the Kalman uh, Syndrome community. You can see the URL there uh, at the bottom uh, of the screen. Uh, and you can join us uh, and the uh, 20 others uh, who are on the community. It was just launched last month in June. Uh, two new stories have been added already. There are 10 documents available uh, and some nice scientific uh, papers to read. Uh, and hopefully this is webinar one in a series of uh, getting to talk to one another and also getting to hear uh, and ask questions of specialists so we can all better understand uh, Kalman syndrome. Um, I'm uh, the community manager uh, of Rare Connect and can be reached um, at this email team at rareconnect.org uh, for any questions on the Kalman syndrome community or any ideas uh, of what you would like to do. Um, human translation is what makes the Kalman syndrome community unique. I mentioned before it's across the five languages. If you're a, a non-Spanish speaker, uh, and you are a registered member, you just need to click on the link to request the human translation at the bottom of each message in a language you don't know. This translation box uh, will pop up and you'll confirm that you want to request the human translation. And later, uh, you will receive an email notification and the translation will be back inputted into Rare Connect. So your advice, uh, your experiences, can now reach people um, that you don't even share language with. Here you see an example uh, of the translation uh, in effect where this original post was written in French. Uh, now there's the English translation, so this uh, other English person uh, could answer uh, and then the French person could get the translation back. Uh, and no matter where you are, we want to help people connect. Uh, Rare Connect is also unique because it's focused on quality information. Uh, we have people uh, like Neil and people like Andrew who, um, when we have questions or when there's stories that are shared or new documents or new news to be added, who we can ask uh, if it's quality, up-to-date, and safe information to be shared with patients. Uh, so we're going to take advantage of those resources and make sure you're getting uh, news that uh, you can uh, count on. 
uh, we're going to have other webinars and I want to show you how easy it is to join us here in the webinar room like Neil and Andrew did today. Uh, first, uh, you will uh, receive an email notification on an up of an upcoming webinar if you are a registered member of the Kalman Syndrome community on Rare Connect. Or you can check into the Kalman Syndrome community on Rare Connect where there will be a public announcement of the date, time, and topic uh, that we'll be talking about. Uh, most webinars will be uh, recorded so that we can hear what the specialists have to say later uh, if we can't make it at that time. So after you've seen that announcement and marked your calendar, you just need to join this link at the bottom. It's one simple link. Enter as a guest with your first name or your pseudonym or your screen name, whatever you prefer to be called. No password re required and you're in. Uh, then you just need to connect your audio. Uh, if you can watch YouTube videos on your computer, you already have the right plugin for the webinar room uh, and we can join others in learning and understanding about Kalman syndrome. So thanks. Uh, there's another way to reach me uh, and there's Rare Connect uh, across the different uh, social media uh, outlets as well. Uh, next, I want to introduce uh, Neil Smith, uh, who's really the reason that we started the Coleman Syndrome community uh, on Rare Connect. Uh, and he's a great uh, patient advocate uh, who um, is always uh, trying to help connect people. Uh, and this webinar is an uh, example of that. So please, uh, Neil and Andrew, um, continue. Great, thanks. Okay. Hello, Andrew. Uh, let me introduce. Okay, hello, Andrew. Um, I just I think some people might have heard my name or seen my. Um, so I'm Neil Smith. I'm from United Kingdom. I'm 44 years old now. Diagnosed with Kalman syndrome when I was 23, and the last few years I've been trying to not act like a patient advocate, but I just uh, I enjoy talking to fellow patients and giving out information about Kalman syndrome and trying to keep up to date with information about genetics and treatments and I just enjoy meeting and talking to other patients. So part of this today will be just trying to introduce you to Andrew Dwyer who is a one of our Kalman syndrome experts who from Switzerland and he is involved with writing a lot of medical papers and a lot of research and treating patients with Kalman syndrome and CHH. I just want to do, do a quick question and answer session some of the basic questions about Kalman syndrome. And in future, we want to try and use these webinars with the help of Rob and, it, and the Rare Connect organization to have almost like online patient meetings where pa patients can come online here, talk to experts like Andrew, Dr. Quinton, and Professor Pittilude, and talk to fellow patients and ask questions that they think they like, like to know more information about. Um, I think I'll introduce Andrew Dwyer now. I think if you want to tell, tell, us, tell us a little bit about himself sure. and his research background. Andrew. Well, thanks for thanks for uh, inviting me, Neil. My name is Andrew Dwyer. I'm trained as a, a, a nurse practitioner, which is a, a nurse specialist. And for the last 14 years, I've worked with patients with Kalman syndrome and congenital hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, uh, formerly in the United States and more recently in Switzerland. And a lot of my work is focused on both clinical treatment uh, for these this rare condition. Uh, understanding the genetics behind this and working with patients and families who live with uh, Kalman syndrome. And that's been a really gratifying uh, part of my work. And most recently, I undertook uh, uh, an internet-based project working with Neil and the uh, working group leaders of the patient advocacy group of the European network that we founded to try to better understand what are the unmet needs of Kalman syndrome patients. And that was a huge success, much to the hard work and contributions of Neil. So I'm pleased to be here and hopefully I can uh, share some information with patients. What we wanted to do today was just to ask some very, I've got about 20 questions, just a basic introduction to Kalman syndrome. But in the future, people like email questions in if they've got specific questions they want to ask Andrew. And we can always email other experts that we know around the world who are going to help ask questions as well. Or you may want to talk to fellow patients because one thing about Kalman syndrome is, is it's quite an isolating condition and most people have never met anybody else with the condition. So it's quite nice to be able to connect with fellow patients and talk to them directly one to one. So hopefully now we're just going to run through some of these questions. If Andrew would like to give us some answers, and just I've got a few slides, so we're going to 
Shall we? Okay. Fire away. Let's do the rest. It. What are the main symptoms of Kamen syndrome and CHH? It's a good question. You know, the, the symptoms of Kalman syndrome and CHH uh, really vary depending on development. So as a newborn, the, really the only signs of Kalman syndrome or CHH might be uh, cryptorchidism or when the testes don't descend normally into the scrotum, or in some cases, micropenis, an underdeveloped uh, penis. Then during childhood, there are really no uh, obvious signs or symptoms of Kalman syndrome because what Kalman syndrome is characterized by is uh, absent puberty and infertility. So oftentimes, it doesn't become apparent until patients don't go through puberty. So it's very difficult to identify early on or during childhood, and oftentimes it's uh, identified in adolescence or early adulthood. The symptoms uh, relate to having very low sex steroid levels. So these can be a variety of things, uh, poor energy level, uh, lack of uh, libido or sexual function. Uh, there can be other associated signs with Kalman syndrome and hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, things like cleft lip or cleft palate, uh, lack of sense of smell, which characterizes Kalman syndrome. Some patients can have some skeletal anomalies. Others can have a missing kidney. Uh, and oftentimes these are not obvious uh, during regular well visits to the pediatrician or the physician. Uh, and again, not everyone has each of these signs. Uh, this is a syndrome which is a, a spectrum. So some patients are very mildly affected and other patients may have lots of symptoms associated with their Kalman syndrome. So sometimes if somebody's born, it's, assuming it's very difficult to diagnose a female with Kalman syndrome or CHH because there's nothing before puberty to indicate there's a problem. And Correct. if a male's born with normal size, well, without micropenis or testes descended correctly, there's nothing for them to indicate they could have a problem until puberty is due. There's quite sometimes uh, maybe. Sometimes there can be clues that there might be a problem. Things like some patients have hearing hearing loss. But this is not just uh, singular to Kalman syndrome. You know, there are lots of patients who have hearing loss without Kalman syndrome. Uh, so sometimes it can be, as you said, difficult to pick up. And I think that contributes to you know, the, the challenges and living with the condition because sometimes patients feel they have the sense that there's something not quite right, but yet it hasn't been diagnosed yet. And that can be really difficult to live with. I've certainly had patients say that to me where they've said, they know something's wrong. They can't say what it is, but they know at 12, 13 that something's wrong, but they can't identify it. So I've, I've got hearing loss and no sense of smell, but nobody commented on that until I was diagnosed correctly at the age of 23. Okay. And, uh, and in that question. interim, Neil, you know, yeah. and in that interim, you know, you, you had a relatively normal childhood and, and early adolescence, oh, yeah. and it really didn't. It, nothing really came uh, to light until your your peers started going through puberty and you noticed that there was yeah. something, but yet you had to wait uh, quite a while to get that diagnosis. And, and that's really, it can be really challenging and, and, and sometimes isolating for, for patients. It was the wait and see approach. Oh, go late developer, late bloomer, to show you had to wait 15, 16, 17. I talked to some, and you have to, I had to wait till three, but some patients get diagnosed at 15, which is, well, I would say easier, but it's not easy for anybody with Kalman syndrome, but I think the earlier diagnosed, it does help. Yes. Uh, and you know, your next question about at what age can puberty be classed as, uh, as being delayed? It's a really good question because, you know, puberty is so variable. You know, by definition, delayed puberty is statistically defined. So we know it's 2.5 percent of the population. But you know, you can look at a kids in junior high or uh, in elementary school, and, and some look close to be adults, and others have not begun puberty at all. And there's a wide variation. But traditionally, we can think of puberty being delayed as a lack of breast development in a girl who's 13, or lack of testicular development in a boy who's 14. Now this can be tricky because you know oftentimes a testicular exam is not part of a regular well visit. So, like you said before, this term late bloomer, uh, sometimes kids get labeled as saying, "Oh well, he'll he'll start puberty on his own. He's just a late bloomer." But uh, the hard part is is when actually there is something wrong that 
patients won't start, the individual won't start puberty on their own. And that's the case with Kalman syndrome. Uh, so I think you know, that the point that you raised about early diagnosis is really critical because the sooner you can get people in line with uh, their, their age mates, their peers, the easier it is kind of socially and some of the psychosocial aspects and psychological aspects of it. Because it's tough to be different in any way in adolescence, much less when you look like you're 12 and your, your kids in your class look like they're 17, 18. That can be um, striking and difficult. You could almost, if you go to your doctor when you're 15, 16 and say, I think something's wrong, you can almost say, I need an endocrinologist or specialist in hormones to take a review and just review the case. Even if you are delayed, you can start treatment then and puberty can start normally, but it's not, it's not good practice just to be left alone, wait and see. It's best to get seen earlier and then get the reassurance, yes, everything's okay, but at least get treatment early. Yes, you raise a good point, and it's difficult because there's no single test that differentiates what is late puberty and someone who will start normally and what's Kalman syndrome. So it makes it a little bit of a challenge, but I think you're right. You know, the fact that if an individual senses that there's something quite, not quite right and they can go to their provider and say, geez, you know, I feel like something's not quite right or they go to their doctor, their um, uh, generalist, you know, that can be the, the starting point for initiating the evaluation and early treatment, which I think is really critical for helping the adjustment process. Uh, but, it, but it's not quite a simple um, diagnosis to come by. But the more that we can have information, so you know, one of the things that we have self, set up with your help is to try to put together um, what are the gold standards for the medical community about how do you evaluate patients with delayed puberty or how do you evaluate patients with presumed Kalman syndrome. And, and putting these on the web available for patients so if somebody types in delayed puberty that they can find this information and ac actually bring this to uh, their healthcare provider, their physician, and say, what do you think about this? So at least trying to give people some tools to help be able to start this dialogue in the process. Especially if you've got any of the minor symptoms that can give you a little bit of clues that you could have, if you have a hearing loss, no sense of smell, a family history of infertility or something else happening in the family where you could, might give you a bit of a clue that something may be going on. It's a really important point you make because, you know, oftentimes we, when we know that oftentimes the person with Kalman syndrome is the only person in their family with Kalman syndrome. But when you look very closely at the, the family tree, the, the family, what we call the pedigree, you'll see that there are often people with either a poor sense of smell or delayed puberty. And this gives you clues that maybe there's something going on. But um, you know, sometimes finding out and asking those questions from family members can be really useful in terms of arriving at a diagnosis a little bit earlier. So this is where we've mentioned symptoms before you can see before puberty. That would be a small percentage of people would be the micro penis, undescended testes, lack of sense of smell, hearing difficulties. So you could have little clues which in isolation you don't mean you've got Kalman syndrome, but if taken together with delayed puberty could give a clue that CARES could be a clue or could be Correct. a good diagnosis. Correct. Yes. Yeah. You're absolutely right. So if in isolation, if you think someone's kind of a, what they think is a quote unquote late bloomer, but there's this other sign like lack of sense of smell or cleft lip, cleft palate, or maybe some skeletal problems or hearing loss, that would really lower the threshold for your uh, starting treatment and, and initiating something. Because what we want to avoid here is having people wait until they're 20, 21, 22, 23 or older to begin treatment. Because at that point, you've really you, you've dealt with not going through puberty for a long time and there can be some, some difficult things to try to, to overcome for that. So we want to try to facilitate earlier diagnosis as much as possible. And I suppose it's, it's much harder to diagnose in females because you've got less visual clues and there are so many other things that cause a failure of menstruation or failure to, or the yeah, menstruation yes. failure. And in some ways for females it's a little bit, the diagnosis might come a little bit sooner because for women there is that hallmark of first menstrual period. It's a very clear sign of when someone has you know, entered into puberty outright. And uh, males don't really have that. You know, you can ask things about, well, are you developing facial hair? Uh, they're very nonspecific. 
Um, so oftentimes when young girls don't get um, their first period, they get referred to the GYN, a gynecologist, um, for evaluation. So we think that this is part of the explanation why there are so many more reported cases of male Kalman syndrome than female, because we think the females are underreported because they're just getting referred uh, straight away to a gynecologist without being fully evaluated for Kalman syndrome. So there is a sex discrimination, uh, be almost one in five, isn't it? Five more males than yeah. females. So, so when it, it's interesting because you, you, for about uh, every female case of Kalman syndrome, there's about four to five male cases. And it can't really be explained by our current genetic understanding. So what we think it is is what we call a bias of ascertainment, meaning we're just not counting the, other, the real cases of uh, female Kalmans because we think they're getting shunted or directed to their GYN straight away, and so they're not getting evaluated by an endocrinologist, so we don't really have good numbers. And in fact, when you look at you know, these family trees or pedigrees of Kalman syndrome, the males and females are equally balanced. So that's another hint to suggest that really we're just missing the female cases. They're just not getting routed to the endocrine office. Um, but it leads into the, the next point you, you raise about how is Kalman syndrome or CHH diagnosed. And as I said before, there's no one gold standard test to say, okay, this is Kalman syndrome, this is CHH. It's really what's called a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning that you have to make sure all of the things that are not causing Kalman syndrome. So it could be that someone's underweight or has um, an absorption problem in their digestive tract, that they don't have a pituitary tumor. So the, the process of being evaluated can oftentimes be lengthy, and that can also be a source of frustration for patients. But it primarily involves taking a very detailed family history, doing a very thorough clinical examination, including a genital exam, and measuring testicular size or a pelvic exam for female patients, uh, and also having hormone levels drawn, as well as undergoing radiologic exams, things like a, ri a wrist x-ray to see if the bones have stopped growing, uh, perhaps a bone density exam, uh, also an MRI to make sure that a tumor is not causing the lack of puberty because uh, those are all things which are important rule outs. They're things that you do not want to miss, um, but that could be potential causes of Kalman syndrome. So the process is one of exclusion and can be lengthy. There's just no simple blood test. You just do, like, like with Kleinfelter syndrome or Turner syndrome, you can just do one blood test, karyotype, count the number of chromosomes, and you can actually have a diagnosis. With Kalman syndrome, there is no genetic test for Precisely a simple right. blood test. No. You know, you, would, you could go in to have a blood test and get your blood count and know that you are anemic, but we don't have that type of simple uh, diagnostic process for Kalman syndrome. Uh, so that, again, that's a, a, another challenge. So your question is, will normal puberty occur once diagnosed and treatment started? This is a question I hear a lot. And I guess the first point about this would be, what do you mean by normal puberty? Um, because that is um, yes. debatable. We know that there are two treatment approaches for patients with Kalman syndrome and CHH. And one includes in developing secondary sexual characteristics. And what do I mean by that is, things that give the outward signs of having gone through puberty. So for females, that means breast development, developing kind of the normal bodily curves. Uh, for males, it means developing facial hair, the deepening of the voice, those virilizing uh, outward signs of having gone through puberty. So for those, those are induced by sex steroids, estradiol predominantly in women and testosterone in men. We can give estradiol and testosterone to induce those secondary sexual characteristics. But if you mean puberty in terms of a process that ends in reproductive capacity, meaning the ability to have fertility and to have a, have a child, then no, those sex steroids will not do that. Uh, that requires specialized treatment to induce fertility. And those, diff those treatments differ between men and women. Uh, for women, it, just like women undergoing fertility treatment, ovulation induction and um, in vitro fertilization can, be, can, can work uh, very effectively. And, but for men, it takes much longer. So women can achieve fertility in a month or two with Kalman syndrome. Uh, oftentimes it's not that short, but it can be. For men, it takes much longer. And the reason why that is is because women are born with all of the eggs that they will ever have in their life. Okay. So they just need to be induced to ovulate them. 
For men, it involves a lengthy process of trying to grow the testes to develop the sperm. And this takes a long time. It can take up to two years in uh, some cases. And it requires uh, specialized centers with a, a, a special regimens of hormone treatments. So I guess that's so, the simplest way I could address the puberty yes. question. But there are some people who, who will just be delayed. They won't have Kalman syndrome, but they'll have delayed puberty. So if you give them the testosterone treatment, they will have normal puberty with testicular growth and be fertile. But if you give testosterone to a person with Kalman syndrome, they won't develop, they won't become fertile and testes will not develop. Correct. So the, the most common approach for patients with young boys with delayed puberty is um, to give them a series of low-dose testosterone. And that's the idea to try to jumpstart the system. Yeah. And in many cases, that is enough to kind of trigger the onset of puberty and the secretion of hormones that are needed to undergo puberty. Um, but for patients with Kalman syndrome, that series of low-dose testosterone won't be effective. You're absolutely okay. right. This is something we can talk more about in other webinars where people can ask specific questions. There's quite a lot we can go into on that subject. We've mentioned this briefly, passing. Does everybody have the same symptoms? But you've mentioned before it's actually a spectrum disorder where people have, don't always have the same symptoms and can vary in severity from person to person. Yes, and I think the point here is that it, there can be very mild cases ranging from that look like just delayed puberty to more severe cases. And that's not to say that it's easier for people with a mild case than it is for people with more severe cases. You know, everyone deals with this differently, but it really is on a range. Um, and that just because, you know, we say things like no sense of smell, that doesn't mean that everyone with congenital hypogonadotropic hypogonadism has no sense of smell. These are a spectrum. So it's, you can think of it as a, a menu of things that can be associated with the condition, but that doesn't mean that everyone will have those same symptoms. So even two brothers will not necessarily, they could both have Kalman syndrome, but they necessarily have the same symptoms. So there could be sometimes a, bit of, a lot of variation between family members. Indeed. And, you know, the, this can be even between twins. You could have twins. Uh, I've taken care of patients who are, have a twin brother, and their twin brother went through a normal puberty, but they have Kalman syndrome. So there's quite a range. There's a bit of terminology, because Kalman syndrome and CHH, CHH is a bit of a long word, long-winded way of saying it each time, but the, what is the fundamental difference between Kalman syndrome and congenital hypogonadotropic hypogonadism? It's a, a question in which we often hear, and it's, uh, the, the, they're the same condition, but for one part, and that's the sense of smell. So Kalman syndrome is simply congenital hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, meaning very low sex steroids and very low gonadotropin levels, with either a limited sense of smell or no sense of smell. And when I say no sense of smell, I mean they can't, patients can't smell uh, garbage, gasoline, nothing. Um, and so that's the, that's the only difference between the two. They're the same condition, they're treated exactly the same. And so does this difference make any difference to the treatments available? So as I was saying, you know, their, their conditions are treated exactly the same. Um, this is, there's no difference between the treatment for CHH and treatment for Kalman syndrome. Okay. And so the any long, yeah, any long term health consequences? Yes. Um, you know, the, the long term health consequences related to Kalman syndrome and CHH, I think, fall into two domains. One is physical uh, health consequences. And these relate to not having those sex steroids around, the testosterone or estrogen. So that can have really deleterious or negative effects on your bone health, meaning it can weaken your bones and make you, give you what's called osteopenia or osteoporosis, which is, uh, puts you at higher risk for having fractures. Uh, it can also contribute to you being anemic and having a poor energy level. Uh, and there's some evidence to suggest that low testosterone contributes to meta what they call metabolic health problems or perhaps being more vulnerable to gaining weight, um, having problems with managing your blood sugar and maybe putting you at risk for developing diabetes. But again, this is 
um, developing and growing evidence. It's not uh, absolutely sure. The other part of long-term health effects of having Kalman syndrome, I put into the, the psychological side. And this, uh, I think, relates to the, you know, living with a rare disease, uh, which can often feel isolating for many patients. Uh, and also, you know, the fact that when patients don't go through puberty at a normal timing, sometimes that can really have a dramatic effect on people's uh, psychosexual development. And what I mean by that is how they feel the comfort that they have with uh, having an intimate life, um, being sexually active, and these things can have um, significant impact on quality of life. So I would kind of put that uh, in that uh, category of kind of the, the long-term psychological potential risks for Kalman syndrome. But the psychology side of KS is, I think, they're not well understood by virtually well, by all doctors, and it's something that's just completely ignored mainly in Kalman syndrome. It's something we could talk about hours, and I do talk to patients online for hours about the psychology of Kalman's and how it how it's how it is to live with this condition. But it's something we can explore for on on future episodes. But it's something that really does affect people, but it affects different people different ways. Some people have no problems with Kalman syndrome at all. Others find it a day to day, just can't escape it. Yes. And, and like you said, it's a very individual. Um, you know, there's no one right or wrong way to deal with something. And uh, it affects people differently. But I think you're absolutely right that just replacing the sex steroid, the estrogen that's missing or the testosterone that's missing, it doesn't take care of everything. There's a bigger piece there that, um, that is often unacknowledged uh, in uh, the healthcare setting. But do, they, do we have to have treatment if you do not have estrogen or testosterone for the rest of your life? It's not, it's not a vital hormone for life, is it? You can actually live without estrogen and testosterone. You can live, yes, but you're putting yourself at risk for all types of health problems. Uh, so typically, patients with Kalman syndrome require lifelong treatment. Okay, there is a phenomenon in about 10% of patients, maybe slightly more, uh, patients who have a spontaneous recovery after being treated with testosterone or birth control pill or uh, some form of uh, Kalman syndrome treatment, and they can, they can recover spontaneously. But the vast majority of patients require lifelong treatment, and I can't stress this enough. You know, if you, patients come off treatment, they don't necessarily feel that different. Um, but yet there can be significant health consequences, particularly to bone health, uh, for uh, their energy level, uh, libido, sexual function suffers. Uh, there, there's a number of things that are happen when patients stop treatment. So it really is something that's important to stick with long term. Okay. Well, that's how we've already seen it covered how it, the main thing is the bone health and the psychology of not having the right energy levels, sleep patterns, and just not feeling the normal drive that most people would, have. especially at a younger age, where you don't have the right sex drive when you're a teenager or a young adult. And another part of this is, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, getting too technical, you know, the sex steroids are hormones which circulate and bind to receptors throughout your body. It's like a lock and a key, you can think about it. And those receptors are all through your body. They're in your brain, they're in the, the gonads and the testes and the ovaries. They're all throughout the body. So of course these hormones have far-reaching consequences and effects throughout the entire body, not just for your bone or developing fertility, but for many, many functions and um, allow you to, to function effectively. This is actually quite a probably quite a difficult question. There's, I know there's quite a range of treatments available. But if we could just outline what sort of replacement methods are available for the men and what sure. sort of products they can have. So just as a side, uh, side to this, for women, the, the primary treatments are uh, hormone replacement, just as uh, or, or a birth control pill. That's a, a standard treatment for women. So that would be the same as any young woman who is taking birth control pill or a postmenopausal woman who is on hormone replacement. Those are standard treatments uh, for women. For men, testosterone treatment will not induce fertility, but is important for maintaining all types of bodily functions, particularly energy level, uh, libido, sexual function, uh, concentration, things like this. And there are lots of different forms. There are long-acting injections, and this is uh, 
like a, a nebido, which is a testosterone undecanoate. It's an injection. It's called, I think, Avid, which was recently approved in the United States. And it's an injection that's given once every three to four months. Uh, there are also uh, injections that are given monthly, and these are come in lots of different what they call esters. So it could be testosterone, cypionate, testosterone, enanthate. And what that means is it's just how they've modified the testosterone to be long-acting. Um, and those are typically given intramuscular uh, monthly. And those can also be given by the patient to themselves. They can be taught how to give the intramuscular injections. There are not less invasive treatments for testosterone. There are gels, which are transdermal gels, which are applied daily. Uh, there's also a buckle, which is like a lollipop that's absorbed through the gum, through the mucosa in the, the, the mouth. And there's a newly prescribed Axeron, which is uh, uh, applied under the arms like a deodorant. Um, so there's a variety of different preparations. And I think the main thing for patients with Kalman syndrome is to really know what the options are and to talk to your provider about what's going to work best for you. Maybe the gels aren't great for some people. Some people love that, but some people like to give the injection themselves. It's very personal, and I really encourage patients to, to try to talk to their providers about what are my options and what's going to work best for my lifestyle. Because at the end of the day, you know, you might go see your doctor a couple times a year, uh, maybe once a year, twice a year, maybe a few times more. But day to day, patients are responsible for taking care of their condition. And I think it's important to find the treatment that's uh, the best fit for the individual. So when I talk to patients, that there's no one treatment which is best for everybody, and everybody's got their own views of which is best for them. And it's down to lifestyle or personal circumstances which works best. Some people love the three monthly injections, some people prefer using the gel. But that's why it's nice to have you say to have the choice. And some people don't have know there's that sort of choice available. And you know, again, it's there's they are all equally effective, right? So they will all raise your testosterone level into a normal range. Uh, it's a very individual choice. And I, I think the power should be in the hands of the patients. Um, and us as healthcare providers should help try to advocate for patients if sometimes an insurance coverage doesn't uh, provide or support a particular form. I think you know, healthcare providers need to be in, engaged in that to help get patients the appropriate type of treatment that they can stick with long term. Okay. Uh, we covered this a little bit briefly about the HRT methods for women. They are the or basically the same ones that are available for women anyway, with the contraceptive pill or standard HR treatments for postmenopausal women. Mm -hmm. uh, is the actual, yeah, go on, sorry. It, just the question is, is the standard oral contraceptive pill alone adequate for women? Uh, yes, if fertility is not sought, obviously. I mean, if you want fertility, you don't take a contraceptive pill. Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. But um, yes, in terms of getting and replacing the hormones, the sex steroids that are lacking, yes, the oral contraceptive pill alone can be effective for giving women a, a natural level of estrogen uh, that's important for their bone health and maintaining different physiologic functions. But is the estrogen level enough the whole month is there there's no there's a constant level of all the, the whole month with the pill isn't there you don't go a week without no estrogen at all so there's different types of uh, perspective there are different per perspectives on uh, oral contraceptives so they have what's called biphasic triphasic and what the idea is they, they adjust the dosing of the amount of hormone throughout the month to try to mimic nat the natural reproductive cycle the natural okay. menstrual cycle um, all of them are equally effective. There's no evidence to suggest that a biphasic pill or that changes levels twice in a month versus a triphasic is any better or any more efficacious or effective. Uh, so really, it comes down to personal. And again, you know, this is something that um, many women are, women with Kalman syndrome, you know, they may have gone a long time without having a period uh, and being diagnosed initially. So sometimes having a period can be a major inconvenience and a real struggle uh, for them. And one of the things that can be done is, you know, you can work with your gynecologist or endocrinologist or primary care provider to figure out what frequency do you really need to have a period. 
maybe having a withdrawal bleed every three months is perfectly sufficient for your uterine health, but uh, maybe it's not essential to have to have a bleed every month. And that can really, really impact positively the quality of life for these patients and help people stick with treatment, which is ultimately the goal to try to minimize the long-term consequences. But do women need to have a withdrawal bleed at some stage or regular just to maintain health? Yes, so, so there's, you know, without getting too far into it, there, there is a physiologic region, reason and a medical reason for having withdrawal bleeds um, to, to diminish the risk for certain types of health com complications or long-term risk for cancers. But this is where you need specialist help and talk yeah, to an endocrinologist I, I because... I don't recommend women decide, oh, I'm not, I'm just going to take my pill for a year and not have a period. These are all decisions which I think the power needs to be in the patient's hands, but it should be a shared decision-making process, okay? So the, the patient should be empowered to have this discussion, but it needs to be an informed discussion with the healthcare provider to, to make a, have a shared decision to say, okay, what's best for this person? Because, uh, you know, the individual without all the medical knowledge is not equipped to make all those decisions, but um, they know what it's like live to, to live day to day with Kalman syndrome, and that should be an important part of the discussion. Okay. This is almost going back to a question we had earlier about the severity of the condition. Is everybody, does everybody who has Kalman syndrome, CHH, always infertile, or can you get people who may be subfertile or may may produce a little bit of sperm or or is it always everybody totally infertile yes you know we talked before that the character hallmark characteristics of kalman syndrome are absent puberty and infertility and again the puberty the patients can have absolutely no pubertal development or they can have some partial pubertal development and indeed there's something uh, a syndrome called the fertile eunuch syndrome which refers to a near normal testicular development and actually sperm development in the testes, but yet the testosterone level in the blood is below the level that is needed to induce full virilization. So you don't get the full beard development and you don't get the full sexual function, but indeed there's enough circulating hormones to stimulate sperm development and testicular growth. So, you know, there's, there's a, a wide range. Again, it's not just one flavor for Kalman syndrome, but the important point that I like to make is that in the vast majority of cases, we are able to induce fertility if that is a desire. And our experience at, with large series of patients reflects about 80% to 90% of patients can achieve fertility with specialized treatment. But again, this should be done in collaboration with a specialist center that really knows what they're doing to help maximize the outcome because there are certain things that predict poorer outcomes for this. So in the most cases, there's a potential to develop fertility but uh, most patients are not fertile in the beginning before treatment. Uh, do you, is there actually a percentage success rate or is the like, majority of patients on, under treatment would become fertile? Because I know there's negative aspects, but... Yeah, so we, you know, there are a couple of, uh, three or four large studies that have been done. When I say large, roughly about 100 patients. Um, and there are different treatment approaches for treating Kalman syndrome. And what some of the work that we're currently doing is trying to tailor the treatment specifically to maximize the potential fertility in patients and really fine tune this um, to get improved outcomes. But based on these large series that have been conducted over the last you know, 15 years, um, it's between 80 and 90% of patients can uh, become fertile. Now, That's quite the high. important the important thing is that you know these patients um, and this is either with uh, replacing the hormone that's lacking an adotropin releasing hormone by a little microinfusion pump like a diabetes insulin pump or by giving exogenous meaning uh, injections of gonadotropins um, so the the success rate is very good with these treatments but we know that there are certain things that can limit success so for instance patients who don't have Test, a normal descended testes at birth have poor outcomes. Patients with particular uh, gene mutations have, tend to have poor outcomes. And these are all things which should be taken into account in terms of discussing with patients and couples what's the likelihood for the uh, outcome for fertility. This is quite a wide area. We can, we can expand this in future discussions because this is a question that comes up a lot when 
I talk to oh, fellow patients. Yeah. We actually mentioned this a, a little bit earlier when there's a reason why the female treatments tend to work quicker than the males, but it's because of the eggs. Yeah. I think. Exactly. And, and again, you, the important point that you say there is tend. Um, everyone is different. Individuals respond to treatment differently. Uh, there are no guarantees. So, you know, some women may be able to become fertile and conceive the first cycle that they go through treatment. And other women may have extended periods. Um, and, you know, this fertility inducing treatment can be a lengthy process and it can be very stressful on couples. So uh, it's something that really requires um, patience and I think very clear uh, ideas about what the expectations are for treatment and what the likelihood is. So people don't ha have realistic expectations about what the, the chances yep. are. Definitely. Can KS or CHH be passed on to the next generation? This is a very good question. It's the $10,000 question, right? So everyone who undergoes fertility treatment wants to know this question. Is my child, if, if we conceive, is my child going to have Kalman syndrome? The possible, yes. Is it definite? Yes. And it's definitely not definite that you'll pass it on. No. You know, the, the more we learn about genetics of Kalman syndrome, the more we realize that it's very complicated. And the one way that I can try to explain this is if you think about really important biologic functions for a species, we as a species to survive, you need to be able to reproduce and you need to be able to metabolize food into energy. Those are really two fundamentally important processes. So it would make sense that our genes have lots of redundancy to compensate for if you just had a change in a gene by chance that you wouldn't, that wouldn't be the end of the line for the species. So what we're learning more and more is that there are multiple genes. It's not just one gene defect that causes Kalman syndrome. It can indeed, but in many cases and in growing numbers of cases, it's a contribution of multiple genetic hits. So as I said earlier, when you look at pedigrees or families with Kalman syndrome, there are oftentimes patients or family members with no sense of smell or just the delayed puberty, but not Kalman syndrome. So it's not a guarantee that patients will pass that condition on to their offspring. Um, the key thing about this is that if we know about it, you can detect, there's a small window of opportunity to detect Kalman syndrome and CHH in the first six months of life. And that's a really yeah, that's a critical piece and is often very reassuring for families to know that um, it could be identified very early. That's it very important point where I don't think many people realize, certainly many doctors are, don't tell the patients that there is that six month period, especially I think it's more prominent in the boys rather than the girls that the six month period of measuring hormone levels when born to, just to see if you've got KS or CHH has been passed on. But there is no reliable way of predicting at the moment is there genetically? No, I, I mean there are certain uh, genes that we know about. We understand how the genes are passed if we take a detailed family history and we know that there's a particular gene defect, defect, so for instance, a gene called Cal1, which was the first gene identified in association with Kalman syndrome, we know how that's passed on and we know that it's X-linked. So we know we can give a, a very good likelihood if somebody has a Cal1 mutation, what the likelihood of passing that on will be. That, that's a pretty straightforward process. But the counseling about trying to determine is there, uh, what's the, chances, the percentage that I could pass this on. It's getting very, very complex, but I still think it's very worthwhile to meet with genetic counselors to discuss this in detail because it's part of a discussion that a couple should have um, because it's, uh, you know, having a child is a, is a major decision, but when you're adding into it a rare disease or, or perhaps the, the, the struggles that an individual has gone through personally to um, be diagnosed and then undergo treatment and achieve fertility, these are important things that need to be discussed and genetic counseling can be really important for that. So I talk to some patients and they think they don't want to have children for the very reason of the struggles they had getting diagnosed in the first place. They don't want to pass that risk on to their children. However, then some people would argue if you know about the condition and know how to diagnose it, there's less, you get less hassle, less 
there's less problems if you know the condition is likely and you're looking out for it at the right age. So you don't have to go through the same stresses the first parent had to go through. But it's all down to individual choice. And as you say, genetic counselling will help you be able to talk through the options and having it in the open so you make an informed choice. And like you said, Neil, you, you've talked to lots of patients and, and you probably have heard lots of different perspectives and opinions on this. There's no one right or wrong way to decide about this. Uh, you know, it's a very individual choice. Uh, but, but like you said, you know, this is, this is something which needs to be made in the context of an individual's feelings and their relationship. So. We've, we've just mentioned this, the postnatal diagnosis for six months. So you can almost ask your doctor, GP, to measure testosterone levels and estrogen levels before the age of six. And if it gives you a detectable peak, it won't tell you KS is not there, but it could give you a good, good clue that, it, that everything's normal. Yeah, so it, there's a very interesting phenomenon that in the first six months of life, hormone levels in a, in a newborn are like that of an adult, which is really striking. It's, it's hard to imagine. You know, a, a newborn boy could have a testosterone of, you know, the, the same as an adult male, but it, it's true. And so it's not it cost effective to screen every newborn child for their hormone levels because it's invasive and it costs a lot of money uh, relatively for a population type of study. But if we know that there's Kalman syndrome in the family, and there's a likelihood or a possibility that uh, the, the offspring could be, the child could be affected, then one could do a, uh, a simple hormone test between two weeks and six months of life and measure those hormone levels. And again, it won't necessarily tell you that it's not there, but if you see that they're undetectable, you can say, okay, we, we know what's going on here. And then you could initiate treatment at an age appropriate time and basically induce puberty with the child so that they are going through puberty at the same time as their peers. And really that would go a long ways towards minimizing some of the psychological effects of the, of the condition. I think we've, we've covered quite a lot today already. Um, I've just mentioned a few, I just wrote out a few more questions that we could possibly ask at future meetings and future webinars. And if people would like to write in, text it, well, email in with other questions they would ask, like to ask Andrew and fellow experts. We can email them and then give us back the replies and we can post them here or have a video conference and ask them directly online. Thank you so much for your time there, Andrew. It's been very informative, so very helpful there. Thank you. And thank you, Bob. Thank you, Neil, and thank you, Andrew. Yes, no problem. Uh, and I hope that anyone uh, who's watching uh, this video uh, has enjoyed what they've heard uh, so far. Uh, I hope you'll join the Kalman Syndrome community on Rare Connect so that you can receive an email when we're doing the next uh, webinar. And I hope you feel comfortable posting your questions uh, on the Kalman Syndrome community on Rare Connect as well so that we can uh, help you to get them answered. Uh, all of us can answer them together. Uh, so that's it for today, uh, and thanks, Neil. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. 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 Bye. Bye.